Good morning and welcome to today's INL Supplier Engagement Webinar Series. I am Stacy Francis and I'm the Small Business Program Manager for the Idaho National Laboratory. A couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, we will be posting the video from today's presentation on our website um, as soon as we get it rendered this afternoon. So you can look for that at procurement.inl.gov and we will drop that down in the questions section so you can see it there. Um, if you have questions for our panelists today, go ahead and put them in that questions panel that you see in your control panel, and we will get to those questions at the end of the presentations. So we will we will do that um, at the end, but we'd love to have your questions uh, for our panelists. So I'm excited about today's webinar. We have a great panel um, with us today, and I'd like to introduce them. So first I'd like to introduce Dr. John Wagner, who recently took over as the lab director. John is no stranger to the INL. In fact, he's been with us for five years in our nuclear science and technology division, helping to advance the next generation of nuclear energy. Joining John are his two deputy managers, Dr. Marianne Walk and Juan Alvarez. Marianne provides strategic leadership and direction for the research and development activities at the laboratory. She joined INL in 2019 after a long tenure at Sandia National Laboratory. Also joining us is Deputy Lab Director and Chief Operations Officer Juan Alvarez. Juan is responsible for keeping the wheels on the bus. He manages the day-to-day -day operations at the lab. The extended bios for our panelists are on our webpage, um, and so you can go out and find those there. Um, with those brief introductions out of the way, let me go on ahead and kick it over to you, John. And John will share his vision for the laboratory and then specifically his vision for the use of small business in accomplishing our missions. Great, thank you, Stacy. appreciate that. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning, uh, even in a virtual way. Uh, as she noted, my name is John Wagner. I'm actually a lab director, but I'll note that I'm kind of the new lab director. I just started in this current role uh, in December of last year, so about three months in. Uh, prior to this role, I was the Associate Laboratory Director for Nuclear Science and Technology. So my background is, is nuclear science and technology research and development. Um, and I was in that role for about three years, been at the lab about five, been in the National Laboratory Complex for a little over 20 years. Um, so that's, that's kind of just quick on my background. The first thing I wanted to communicate with this group, it looks like we're up to about 140 attendees at this point, which is, is wonderful to see, um, is that INL is doing very, very well. Uh, I've, been, I've taken over the, the laboratory in a time when it's doing incredibly well, and I'll speak a little bit more to that. But specifically as an example, uh, we've received an A-plus grade from the Department of Energy five of the last six years. Um, and, uh, and, and that's you know kind of almost unprecedented. Uh, that includes 2020, uh, which of course, uh, like all of you, uh, we had to work through a pandemic uh, when many of our employees were uh, had to quickly move to telecommuting almost exactly uh, a year ago uh, this week, and actually be a year ago uh, next week, uh, which changed how we operate in our facilities, how we do a lot of different things. But we've we've uh, we've overcome those challenges and are working quite well uh, in our accomplishments even under these conditions. Uh, obviously, as a new laboratory director, I want to keep the positive momentum going that we've had, but I also want to take this laboratory to the next level. Uh, this will require uh, innovation, planning, discipline, uh, kind of renewed focus on operational efficiencies, uh, and of course, execution. Uh, in the nuclear portfolio, uh, I'll say it means that it's time to build. Uh, so again, my, my background, I've been in, in nuclear for well over 20 years. And we haven't built new advanced reactors uh, in that time period. And so our focus is now to stop talking about building uh, advanced nuclear and proceed with building and demonstrating advanced nuclear reactors. And we have a plan for that. Um, I won't go through all the details of that plan, but we are, we are working towards a, what I'll call a cadence of advanced reactor demonstrations, starting with very small nuclear systems uh, we have, we've got one that uh, we call Marvel that will be demonstrated in the 2022-2023 timeframe. The next is, is expected to be the Department of Defense's Pele project in the 23-24 timeframe. Uh, after that, we expect to demonstrate TerraPower's molten chloride research experiment in the 24-25 timeframe. 
And there's a whole series of reactors that come uh, after that, including our versatile test reactor and the UAMPS project uh, to demonstrate the new scale small modular reactor technology uh, on our site. Uh, a commercial operation is anticipated uh, of the first module in June of 2029. The National Reactor Innovation Center, uh, housed here at the Idaho National Laboratory, is facilitating and coordinating reactor testing and demonstration. And I know you've, if you've participated in, in this series in the past, uh, the, the, the NREC team, National Reactor Innovation Center team, uh, has spoken to this group uh, twice in the last uh, in the last year. So this growth is not confined to the nuclear uh, part of the mission here. We're also having seeing significant expansion in our national homeland security portfolio, as well as our broader clean energy uh, portfolio, a lot of which involves integrating uh, intermittent renewable sources with base load power, such as nuclear, things like hydrogen production and other uses of energy uh, beyond electricity. Obviously, we cannot do this alone. That's part of the reason that we're, we're talking today. Uh, it's a team effort that includes the small businesses who already are helping us. Many of you are already helping us accomplish our goals. Um, I'll say again that, that uh, much of my career has been focused on nuclear science and technology research and, and, and development. So in this new role as lab director, I, do, I will tell you all, I, I do have much to learn. Uh, including about our relationships with our small business partners. Uh, as I researched this area, I was encouraged uh, by what I've discovered and optimistic that we can do even better. But IDEL is already doing quite well um, in this in this space. Uh, we each each fiscal year we start out the year with specific goals about our business spending, and we and we put those goals into six areas: our overall small business spending, uh, which which accounts for 51% of our spending. Our small disadvantaged businesses, our hub zone or historically underutilized business zones, women owned small businesses, service disabled veteran owned small businesses, and our Idaho concerns goals. In fiscal year 2020, which we uh, just concluded at the end of September of 2020, we exceeded our goals in each of these areas. Overall, we had a goal of spending 51% of our allotted funds with small businesses, and we exceeded that goal by 15%. Uh, our goal was to spend 30% of our allotted funds with Idaho businesses. Again, we exceeded that goal, in that case, by 13%. Uh, looking deeper, I discovered that Idaho met or exceeded the goals in every area but one over the last six fiscal years. So we've got an excellent record to build upon, um, and it's showing up in our bottom line. During the recent fiscal year, uh, I'll just give you a summary of, of what we spent uh, we, we purchased $352 million worth of goods and services from small businesses. Of that, $229 million of that came from Idaho businesses uh, located throughout the state. And to give you just kind of a perspective of that, in just eastern Idaho, we spent $143 million in 218 businesses. Western Idaho, we spent over $67 million uh, among 74 different businesses. Southern Idaho, uh, just about 8 million uh, with nine different businesses. North Idaho, uh, a little over 6 million with 10 businesses. Southeast Idaho, uh, a little under 4 million for, with 32 businesses. And then Central Idaho, 62,000 with four businesses. So that just give you a perspective of how we're spread across um, the state uh, in terms of our small business spending. So I see that we're doing a good job with small businesses, but I think this team here, led by Stacy, uh, would tell you that we believe we can do and must do even better, especially given the growth um, in the different uh, numerous projects uh, that we anticipate on the site over the next couple of years. So the growth is um, is again not just in the nuclear area; it's construction. It's, it's really across the entire portfolio. And as we, as we grow, we do, uh, I do, see the attributes of small businesses and what you all can bring to the table is absolutely essential to our success. So a couple things to note, maybe a little background for, and maybe a reminder for some of you. Right now we have 5,200 employees, just a little over that. Uh, we, come, we contract with subcontractors in a variety of areas. Um, and we bring in hundreds of interns uh, to, the, to the laboratory every year. And over the next five years, 
our, our goals projections have us growing by at least a thousand new employees over the next five years. And I'll tell you, our, our growth just in the last couple of years would suggest that it's probably going to exceed that. Or certainly we've been growing at a, at, a, at a faster pace than that over the last couple of years. Small businesses are vital um, right now to our work. And, uh, and I think they'll be even more so as we grow. And you know that's because at least in, in my perspective and experience with small businesses, they tend to be laser focused on their areas of expertise. Uh, their success or failure is determined by their ability to provide a specific service or product. And as a large organization, I know benefits greatly from that focus. Uh, small businesses that, that many of you probably run tend to be agile and acutely aware of, of market innovations and are able to, um, to really have a unique ability to look at our processes and make recommendations on how we can do things better. So I think you're, you're hopefully getting really clear that uh, I have a strong emphasis and a commitment to small business partners and that will not waver under my leadership. Um, we recognize the importance uh, of your contributions to our laboratory. And I wanted to note, you know, as a taxpayer funded institution, we have an obligation to get the best bang for our buck and small businesses provide just that. So I already talked about some of my goals for the laboratory. Maybe I'll have a chance to talk a little more about that during the Q&A. But uh, I do want to note that, the, you know, just like the time is to build in nuclear, the time is now for public private partnerships to bring real innovations to the marketplace where they can change lives. A strong focus for me will be outcomes and impact of the research that this laboratory provides uh, for the nation and beyond. And this does not happen without a robust supply chain. So that's something that we've been spending a lot of time on recently, shoring up our domestic supply chain, uh, getting a lot of attention uh, as it relates to our, our goals, but also to energy and security. And we know knowing where we have vulnerabilities and where we where there are opportunities is a critical first step uh, to support our customers and our operations. So last year we took a deep dive into better understanding what problem are we trying to solve in our supply chain, you know, in terms of talent, in terms of goods and services that we need. And we, we looked at trying to answer a few key questions around this. You know, what is the, the workforce that we need to support our growth? Do we have the suppliers already that we need? And if not, what suppliers, additional suppliers do we need? Uh, will our suppliers be available to provide us the goods and materials we need when we need it, especially uh, with anticipation of some significant large uh, projects on the site? And can we improve upon our existing supply chains and leverage a strong foundation to build more opportunities, particularly in, in meeting our national energy and security needs? So we built a roadmap that outlines what we see as our biggest areas of need in the workforce and compared this to trends regionally and nationally. This is posted on our website for those who want to see our results. In fact, I would encourage you to look at that. Um, rather than competing with others for what we need, we're sitting at the, the table with educators, uh, the trades, state, government, and suppliers to develop solutions that, uh, that are viable and sustainable for all of us. With better planning, the right partnerships and accurate forecasts, we are crafting solutions that will help us achieve our mission. Uh, upcoming efforts include building the right programs with our educational leaders, uh, which is very it's active right now, strengthening our existing supply chain for goods and materials providers and a secure supply chain, and bringing in new suppliers where we see the gaps. So I wanna conclude my remarks by talking a little bit about what you can do to work with INL and how we can help you through our process. First, I wanna encourage you to do your research. Uh, spend some time on our website. There's a lot of great information there. Understand our mission and where your company might help us uh, with our work. Uh, there's an enormous variety of work conducted at INL, and that requires a diversity of suppliers and other businesses. Oftentimes, I think that gets overshadowed by construction and uh, as people think of the big projects, and of course, that's incredibly important, but uh, I want to emphasize that we need help across a, a spectrum of capabilities. I'd also encourage you to get in touch with Stacy Francis, who introduced me just a few moments ago in our small business uh, program office. I know that you'll find Stacy uh, a wealth as a wealth of information and very helpful in assisting you navigating the process and helping you figure out where you might fit in 
uh, with our mission work. So with that, I'll close. It was great to be with you uh, today, and I look forward to uh, questions that you may have. And next, I think we're going to transition to Marianne Walk, uh, our Deputy Laboratory Director for Science and Technology at the laboratory. Thank you, John. It's great to be here with all of you today. I'm uh, Marianne Walk. I've been here at INL for just a little bit more than two years. And my technical background is actually in geophysics, but I've been working in nuclear for a long period of time, as well as other clean energy technologies and some national security activities as well. My title is Deputy Director for Science and Technology and Chief Research Officer at INL. And, and uh, prior to coming to INL, I spent 33 years at Sandia National Laboratories, both in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and also in Livermore, California. It's great to be in Idaho. I'm enjoying my time here so far. Look forward to more time here coming in the future. So my job today is to talk a little bit about how the science and small businesses can interact with our research and development activities here at INL. We've got so many uh, things going on, as John described. We're working with our industry partners on advanced nuclear technologies. We're powering NASA missions like the Mars Perseverance rover that's just recently landed on Mars, working on power grid resiliency, longer lived lived electric batteries, uh, just all sorts of exciting things going on at the lab and how can small businesses fit into those activities. It can be challenging, but we have some mechanisms and I'm gonna go into those in a few minutes. Uh, even, and even projects involved with our most advanced technologies require supplies, expertise, and capabilities we can get from the small businesses in our region. Building advanced reactors, expanding our use of electric vehicles, low carbon energy future won't happen without our small business partners. So your, your success is important to our economy and our communities, and it's also important to our laboratory. And that's, we're really dedicated towards that. Uh, so I'm going to highlight now for you a couple of programs that may be assistance, be of assistance to our small business partners, and which the INL employees should also be aware of as we work to partner with small businesses in the community to achieve our R&D goals. So the first one I'll mention is the INL's Technology-Based Economic Development Grant Program. So this program is focused on Eastern Idaho itself and it attempts to spur economic development and entrepreneurship and innovation in our local community. And we provide grant money to connect industry partners, develop business plans, identify opportunities and researchers, research, and also uh, help get venture capital and other things like that. So a couple of examples of this recently is we've established a database to increase coordination between Idaho's manufacturers using these funds. We have provided funds to the Idaho Women's Business Center to hire an associate director. And another is we have helped expand business opportunities in Butte County, our neighbor, which is clearly a key location for our 890 square mile site west of town. So those are a few um, things that we've done with that particular program. A couple of other programs that are important for our research and development activities are the Small Business Innovation Research Program, or SBIR, and the Small Business Tech Transfer Program, or STTR. These are both federal programs that provide funds to small businesses for two different purposes. So SBIR has to do with actually doing research and development to develop capabilities and products uh, cooperatively between the national laboratories and the small businesses. And then there's two phases for those, phase one programs, which are smaller and then larger phase two grants. And then STTR, the technology transfer program, offers small businesses access to commercial technologies that have been developed at universities and national laboratories, national labs like INL. So we've, we're beginning to show some good results with these programs, and we'd like to do more with Idaho small businesses in these programs. I'm gonna give you a few examples and it so happens that none of these examples are from Idaho companies. So we're looking to change that for the future. So here are a few examples. We have a Maryland company that's working with INL on technology to determine 
the quality of forages, grains, and grain products more accurately so we can convert to clean energy. We have a large biomass program here at INL, and that's a perfect match with that company with our capabilities to, to go commercial. The second example is a Virginia company working with our lab to develop better sensors for nuclear reactors. Clearly, nuclear reactors are high radiation environment. It creates challenges for sensors to know what's going on as we're irradiating. And so that's an important area for us. And then thirdly, a California company is working with INL to develop laser-based non-contact ultrasound technology to detect cracks and strains on systems in high radiation nuclear settings. Again, this is more of a monitoring type of aspect for high radiation uh, systems. And again, very important for our nuclear energy future to be able to do those types of in-situ measurements while we're running nuclear reactors. We would love to see more Idaho-based companies participating in these programs. And before the pandemic started, we conducted an SBIR roadshow, which went around to cities across Idaho to spread the word about this innovative program. We're looking forward to doing more with that. So please, uh, look into these things and well, I'm going to give you some names for contacts. Uh, Stacy Abrams can also help, help you get connected with the right people at INL to work with the SBIR and the STTR programs. So this is really emphasizes the importance of networking and learning from each other. Uh, you can talk with your industry colleagues, the economic development professionals that we have here at INL and elsewhere. And as John said, you know, do, do some homework. If you want to understand the lab, talk to us, call us up, uh, look at our website, and et cetera. We're happy to help you. That's why we're here. Uh, we have people whose jobs are, it is to work with the private sector for the benefit of your companies and the taxpayers to fund our research and development uh, efforts. This is, a, this is a mission of the Department of Energy, and we are funded to, to do such things. So here are some names. Uh, Stacy Francis is our small business office person. We have Jason Stolworthy, who is our technology transfer director. So specifically for the STTR program in particular, he is a great contact. Um, Amy Lintz works our supply chain program. And Corey McDaniel is our industry engagement director. So he helps work deals between INL and various industries and would be happy to talk with you. So we're, we are here to help you succeed. And uh, we understand how important small business is uh, to our ability to complete our clean energy and national security missions. So thank you for listening. And I am next going to turn it over to Juan Alvarez, our Deputy Laboratory Director for Management and Operations. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, and again, good morning to all of you. Uh, my name is Juan Alvarez. Uh, I've been at the laboratory now for Gosh, about 16 years. So actually, this is my third time to Eastern Idaho and uh, and working at the uh, at the laboratory. So I uh, I've been very uh, I've been much honored uh, to be in this role and to be part of what has been an incredible growth uh, since the Battelle Energy Alliance assumed the management and operating contract uh, back in 2005. Uh, so I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about uh, you know our business in particular how important transparency is uh, for us in our engagement with you as a small business owner. Uh, you know, we started looking, you know, as the lab has grown and the lab has, I mean, I look at the numbers and, and John talked about the growth in the last two years. Uh, I look all the way back to our first full year here at the INL. And I think our total revenue at the time was about 638 million. Uh, this year, I think we're expected to finish our, our revenue at one point, almost $1.7 billion. So pretty significant growth uh, since uh, we assumed the contract back in 2005. Uh, so, so with that growth, we've also seen the growth in the small business engagement with the lab. But over the course of the last uh, year or so, we sat down and started looking at strategically, how can we better engage all of you in the success of the INL and have you be a big part of the economy the economic engine that drives the Idaho National Laboratory. And, and we started asking ourselves, what are the kind of things that we could do to have you better be prepared and better informed about what the opportunities look like? And so transparency is a big part of that. And we're trying to improve our websites to include more current information. We're making a greater effort to educate. Uh, we, we know how difficult it is 
to work with the management and operating contractor in the sense that we got government rules and all, all these kind of uh, processes and procedures that for a small business are pretty challenging. Uh, you know, you're going after, let's say, $100,000 worth of scope of work, and, and, and you could be inflicted with $25,000 of work just dealing with the administration of just engaging with us. So we recognize those challenges, and we're working to try to continue to lower those uh, barriers to having a small business work with us in a much more effective and efficient way. Uh, but part of that also is informing you and educating you and giving you as much information as possible. So we are going to be made highly committed to be as transparent as we can. Uh, you know, Stacy, uh, as our program manager, we have high expectations of her to be engaged with all of you in ensuring that you get the information you need to successfully be able to bid uh, or uh, seek work uh, in partnership with the Idaho National Lab. So transparency is a big part of what we're trying to do. Another part that I want to, you know, there's about three other topics I want to kind of cover with you this morning. Uh, one of it is really, what are some things that we're doing different that we haven't done? We did it uh, probably maybe about 10, uh, 12 years ago and learned from it, but we really had never gone back to it. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and how we engage small businesses, maybe grow these partnerships. The other part is how do we assure equal opportunity and how do we remain committed to, to having all kinds of small businesses be involved with the Idaho National Lab. And, and then in closing, I want to talk a little bit about the supply chain and some of the things that we see changing with the administration, uh, which is creating opportunities, uh, I think, for all of you and us uh, that maybe they weren't there before. So first of all, uh, on a small business partnership. So we're uh, this summer, I think we're going to come out and really look for restarting again the, what we call the Mentor, Mentor Protege Program an opportunity for us to partner with a small business and really provide them the assistance and the support they need to be successful as a small business doing business at the Idaho National Level. Uh, we've done Mentor Protege before uh, at a small scale uh, and got some lessons learned from it. We, we have uh, learned a lot from our partners at the Idaho Cleanup Project. Uh, they've been, uh, they have, they have been uh, I would say, more greater users of the uh, Mentor Protege uh, program. And we want to get back into it. We want to be able to build that long-term relationship. To see, for us, it's not just about having a, a small business provide us some product or service as part of a transaction. We're interested in strategic partnerships that grow over time and become more impactful, more, 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 more a part of the fabric that makes the Idaho National Lab. So we are going to be kicking off this mineral, mineral protege program. You hear more about it as the year progresses. I believe we're going to try to roll it out this summer. For those of you who are interested, uh, this is an opportunity. We're going to start with one partnership as a mentor protege and then hope to grow that as we ourselves get comfortable with it and learn from it. Uh, so uh, I urge you to kind of in, in get engaged in that regard. The other part I want to cover is the really the equal opportunity access to the INL. Uh, we're not just committed to really bringing in and, and, and creating better and more strategic partnership with the small businesses. We also want to reach out to the small businesses, the small disadvantaged uh, small business, so veteran-owned small business or woman-owned small business or businesses that are working in urban areas, hub zone type small businesses. Uh, we want to be able to get access to that, including Native American-owned uh, small businesses. You know, partnering, we have a long-lasting uh, partnership with the Shoshone Bannock tribe in a number of areas in education, for example. And we want to be able to expand it to Native American businesses, not just from the Shoshone Bannock, but all the tribes in the state of Idaho that, frankly, ought to be participating. Uh, their businesses ought to be participating in the opportunities at the Idaho National Park. So we want everyone at the table. We want to have an opportunity, again, to, to bring the right skills, bring the right services, products to the table that will help us. Because as you heard John talk about, the INL continues to grow. And, and, and our challenges continue to be great, not just in capital construction, but in really in the mission work. And we need a lot of uh, help and specialties that will help us uh, grow that mission work and be able to execute it effectively and efficiently. Lastly, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the supply chain. So the new administration has, a, a, has come out with very uh, clear concerns about not only the, the source of the supply chain, but also, uh, with the policy to really grow more American jobs and involve more Made in America 
type products. Uh, I think that that's going to create a, a, an opportunity uh, to involve more small businesses and us to seek out more small businesses as we ourselves implement those uh, expectations and policies from the administration as a government contract. So I think there's an opportunity to look at the supply chain from your perspective, uh, look at how you could bring more of that made in America to the table, where you also can bring in more of that risk management, where you understand where uh, your materials originate, where the components are put together, uh, because that's going to become very relevant to a lot of the technologies and products that we work with at the Idaho National Lab. So in conclusion, I want to kind of share, because uh, we've been in this journey, and I've been in this journey now for a long time, uh, love to see the growth that we've had in small businesses, but we wanted it to be now more strategic, more impactful. And we wanted to reach out to a broader base than maybe the traditional businesses that, that have done business with the INL. That's going to take education. It's going to take transparency on our part to make it more clear to you what the opportunities are. It's going to take uh, you engaging more proactive, proactive with us and reach in and get to know the people at INL. I will tell you the INL is a it's you know it's a 5,200 plus organization, uh, and it and it has you know has geographical separation divisions because of just the massive size of just the, our footprint geographical footprint. So I urge you that you know it's easy to get frustrated because we're also a government contractor. So use our resources, reach out to Stacy, you know communicate to her with us. When you're having trouble understanding, engaging, or something just doesn't seem like it's gone the way that it that you expected that it would that it would go, because we want to be successful in this effort, and we can't do it alone, and uh, and so we need to have the feedback from you, and that's what we've been out and done surveys and done a lot of focus groups and trying to better understand how we, as an institution, can do a job, a better job, uh, reaching out to our small business community in a more productive way. So those are kind of my, my final words. I will turn it over now to Stacy, who's going to moderate our Q&A session. And again, thank you for what you do for not only us, but for the state of Idaho, and maybe even outside of the state of Idaho in your support of uh, our procurements and, and, and supply chain. Thank you. Thanks, um, Juan, and thanks, John and Marianne. Um, John and Marianne, if you want to bring your cameras back up. Um, we've got some questions, and if you guys have more questions, just keep dropping them in there, and, and we'll run through these. So the first question I have is, what is the best way for our local small businesses to recognize and prepare to fulfill needs for the INL that they may not currently be equipped to provide? So so this kind of goes to that the glass ball, right? The crystal ball, right? What are we going to need and how can they prepare themselves? Um, John, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure, I'll try to take a stab at that. I, I think that, you know, as I, as I did know, the, the first thing is to just familiarize yourself with the, uh, the laboratory and its missions. Uh, I noted there's a lot of information on our website. Perhaps may seem a little bit overwhelming, but still that's the right place to start. Uh, and, there, and I referred to at least one report. Um, actually, I'll also note that, uh, uh, Stacy, the, the link that you put into the chat, um, which actually I have up here on my other screen, shows all the different meetings that you all have conducted uh, over the last little bit more than a year. There's a lot of good presentation materials uh, and information there as well. I've actually looked through a, a quite a bit of it myself. And um, so that's a great thing. And then, you know, maybe, uh, maybe Stacy, you might not like me saying this, but, but talk to Stacy. Uh, I, I think that she's got her finger on the pulse of all this. She's been involved in all of these meetings and certainly is familiar with the laboratory and, and can help with answer those kinds of questions as well. Um, but uh, I, I will, you know, maybe maybe note again, there's a really, really broad set of, of skills and businesses that we need to support our mission. Uh, I am a nuclear engineer. A lot of us think of INL as just a nuclear laboratory. But when you look at all the systems controls and all the different technologies in the clean energy area, the biofuels, there is a lot of diversity in the kinds of skills and capabilities that we need. And so it's almost, it's almost hard for me to imagine that a company doesn't have a potential offering of interest to us. So making that match, um, again, 
I'd, I'd look at all the information that's there, get at least somewhat educated, and then have a conversation with Stacy. Vaughn or Marianne, do you have anything to add to that one? I'll, I'll butt in for a second and just say that we occasionally have public seminars often through our Center for Advanced Energy Studies that talks about topics that are of current interest to us. And so if the small business community uh, wants to monitor our website for those opportunities, then we can, that's another way for them to understand what we're currently looking at in terms of technology needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that I would add that sometimes we don't even know what we're gonna need um, as we look for future missions, right? We we don't know what we don't know. Um, I see that especially in the in the world of like advanced construction technology. Um, it's it's emerging so fast. Advanced manufacturing. We maybe don't even know what we need yet. So um, that that builds on what Juan has said about trying to increase the transparency of the operation and and the opportunities here for what we need. And um, we are we are going to try and improve that. Um, opportunity forecasting as part of our small business transformation as we move through the next year and, and next couple of years. So um, again, keep your eye on that opportunities webpage. I know I keep telling you that eventually we'll get there. Just be patient with us. Um, we are um, an m and contractor for the federal government. And unfortunately, we don't move as quickly as maybe we would even internally like to move sometimes. And so just be patient with us as we um, continue to move in that direction of providing uh, more transparency in those opportunities and what we need. Um, we have a question here, is there a need for commercial art, specifically interior designers, um, architects, commercial engineers? Um, Brian, why don't you reach out to me directly and I will connect you with our intern interior de decorator, our interior designer, um, Julie. I will send your information along to her, so, so reach out to me on that one. Um, Marianne, here was one that came from the information that you shared on the SBIR and they wanted the contact information, so I dropped that in their form for Jason. Um, uh, who is the supplier contact? That would be me. So reach out to me at stacy.francis at inl.gov. Um, folks wanting contact information for Amy and Jason. Um, Michelle did drop everybody's contact information that uh, Marianne mentioned in the chat. So if you wanted to look in the in the chat feature here, um, she did drop everybody's email um, into that for your for your information. Let's see. Juan, here's one that's interested in the Mentor Protege program. Who do they contact? Me. Um, I put my information in there. Um, we're seeing a pattern here, Stacey. Yeah, you're seeing a pattern? Let's see, can you tell me who the INL contact is for processing and handling the Davis-Bacon prevailing wage um, approver for, for the certified payroll report? Me, get a hold of me and I'll put you in touch with Angela Casper. Um, how will the environmental movement impact the long-term plans of nuclear power technology implementation in the long-term? Um, can this become a long-term effort in futility? John, you wanna take that one? I, I'm not sure about the long-term effort and futility aspect of that, uh, but, but certainly what we've seen is, in, if I'm answering the question in the right way, uh, certainly environmental considerations, particularly around carbon emissions, has driven a lot stronger um, support for nuclear. In fact, uh, as I mentioned, I've been in this in this space a long time and watched a number of prominent environmentalists move from anti-nuclear stances to pro-nuclear stances, uh, particularly in the last few years. And so uh, with this administration and even previous administrations, we're seeing strong bipartisan support uh, for nuclear for a variety of reasons, but uh, certainly carbon emissions, clean energy, the environment is a, a strong driver for interest in nuclear energy currently, and actually is what's driving a lot of the private sector investments uh, into nuclear currently. Great, okay, let's see. Are there recordings on past meetings? Yes, that's on our webpage at procurement.inl.gov. Um, 
I scrolled past this one. I have to get back to it. Uh, when a small business has a new innovative product that can help save INL thousands of dollars, how can we go about sharing or presenting this product to the correct department? Um, again, contact me and I will put you in touch with the, the right folks internally. Um, that's my job to be a connector. Realize that when I connect you with other folks, if we don't have an immediate need, they may not get right back to you, unfortunately. Um, they're busy. They have, we, they have um, they're, they're trying to um, work on accomplishing the mission here. And, and sometimes there's just not an immediate need in the area that you, that you are representing. Um, but I do share that information out to the program and to the appropriate uh, contract specialist or procurement agent so that they keep and they keep a running folder of um, information that I've sent to them. So if they get a requisition in, they can go back and do the, the market research to try and find um, small businesses or, or bus any businesses in some case um, that can help support that need. So um, again, reach out to me. Where do you post most of your upcoming procurements? I looked on your procurement page and there's only one posting. Yeah. Um, do you go through beta.sam.gov or do most of does work of your most of your work go through your current um, contractors? I'm I'm gonna guess. Um, so we don't post a lot through um, beta.sam.gov. Um, there is one out there right now for some NASA work. Um, we do post those out there, but those are those those really uber uber large, um, highly specialized projects. Um, this one's on propulsion uh, for to the moon, so that's what's out there right now, I believe. For um, specific opportunities here at the lab, um, we don't post those out to beta.sam.gov. So again, you're gonna look at the opportunities webpage. And again, Juan and I are committed to increasing that transparency in the opportunities and getting some more posted out there. Um, but again, that's an area that we're going to work on. So, so keep checking that web page. We'll, we will get there eventually. Um, we are a small manufacturer located in Pennsylvania. Would I know work directly with us or would you prefer we partner with an Idaho, Idaho small business? Um, we always have a preference for small and we follow the federal acquisition regulations um, and the simplified acquisition threshold for set-asides to small business. Um, so we do have a preference for small business that's built into our contract. Um, but with that being said, we do work with large businesses as well because we, we have a hard time getting like nuclear fuel from small businesses. So uh, we do work with large businesses as well. Um, Jeff, reach out to me again and, and we can have that discussion and, and I, can, I can share with you what I have. Um, here's a question on women on set aside. Um, do you do women on business set asides? And what is your typical acquisition procurement cycle for IT and professional services? Um, Joel, why don't you reach out to me and I can address that. We are fortunate that we do really, really well in our women owned small business category. Um, we are currently running about 20 percent for FY21, so that's that's really good. Um, that being said, we don't do set-asides in many of the socioeconomic categories. We'll do small business set-asides, but if we do one within the socioeconomic categories, it's very strategic. Um, we did one a couple years back for engineering services, and it was a specific service-disabled veteran-owned set-aside. So, so we're very strategic when we do the, the individual socioeconomic set-asides. But if you have questions on that, again, hit me up. Let's see. What can we do to increase our exposure to the people who require engineering services at INL? Um, again, this kind of goes back to what everybody's touched on. It's doing your research. It's, it's that networking. It's, it's reaching out to the professional organizations that you belong to and, and touching base and connecting that way. I can share with you the, the engineering manager's name and email address, um, but it's going to be incumbent on you to, to kind of reach out through other organizations um, to try and, and reach a little deeper into the organization. I'll help you as much as I can. Um, 
and we will work with our internal folks to, to um, have them reach back out to you as well. I think that that would be a, a good effort for us as well, Ron. Our one is to have that, to have them um, reach back out. Yeah, I, one of the things that, I, that I've that i noticed in the past that's worked well is when we have a, a company that has a particular set of capabilities, Stacy, that you've had, a, you've had a chance to look at, uh, we've been able to go and gather the different uh, INL stakeholders, the different uh, segments of our organization that have interest, right? And we brought in the small business and kind of have like a half an hour or an hour get together. So instead of them trying to chase all the different players throughout the company, uh, we could bring in all the principals into one room and you more effectively outreach to them on your capabilities. And they could tell you whether they're really interested or not, or whether they really have a need in those areas. Uh, because a lot of times if you go one-on-one -on -one and the people are reaching into the organization they're busy people right and they they mm -hmm. don't want to it uh, reaching in sometimes because it just is a distraction so working with stacy manage all of that so that we could be more proactive and and frankly better uh, disciplined about how we do that so good question yeah um don has a question about opportunities uh being available for small businesses in the region. She's located in Georgia. Um, Don, we do business all across the United States. So there's opportunities outside of the state of Idaho as well. Again, reach out to me. Um, our company does IT support, program management, cybersecurity. Um, what types of work will we have in these areas and should we work elsewhere? Are DOE Q clearances required to support the R&D and IT service work that we have? Um, John did touch on the fact that that our national and homeland security mission is growing and so I believe we're going to see we, we already have a need in this area and we're going to see um, a growing need as as that mission expands um, and so you don't necessarily necessarily have to have the clearances um, but for some of that work you absolutely will um, so that's a that's a great question too yeah, Stacey, if I may, um, you know, that's a, that's a very significantly growing area, one that we are challenged in, in workforce in particular right now. So definitely opportunities in that space. And as Stacey rightfully said, it, 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 it crosses. There's, there's, unclass, there's a lot of unclassified work. There is classified work. So you, you don't need a security clearance necessarily to be a contributor. Uh, we do uh, actually subcontract out a lot of IT support work as well. Um, and that is uh, typically, I don't think any of it requires a clearance. There may be some exceptions, but, uh, but generally that's not uh, work that requires clearance. And then if I may, I want to go back to a comment, probably four or five comments before uh, somebody was asking if you have a great idea that can save us thousands of dollars, um, you know, what do you do? So obviously talk to Stacy, but that's exactly what I'd love to hear is people coming forward rather than what do, what do we know we need, you know, you know, we need skills or we need help in a certain area. If you all have technologies or ideas that could save us money, I'm, I'm pretty focused on us being able to execute our mission uh, more effectively, more efficiently. And uh, so really want to strongly encourage those kinds of ideas uh, to be brought forward. That's great. Um, we're, we've got a lot of, well, we still have a little bit of time. Okay, let me scroll back up here. Um, if, if anybody's, I'm seeing, I'm seeing kind of a trend here in the question. If you're looking for a specific uh, point of contact, like maybe in environmental safety and health, um, again, reach out to me and I can connect you with the right people there. Um, One, there's several questions in here on staff augmentation and providing um, staffing support through staff augmentation. Do you want to address that? Sure. Uh, I mean, obviously, we, we make use of staff augmentation. We've had uh, several staff augmentation subcontracts here at the Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, you know, over time, frankly, we're getting a little bit sloppy on the use of staff augmentation. They really ought to be short term. Uh, subcontract arrangements and and you know I've looked around and I've had staff augmentation staff that have been around for three to five years uh, I mean and, and to me that was that's probably not the intended use of uh, staff augmentation subcontracts so we do have opportunities in this area because we have short-term needs where we need to backfill 
or, or build positions. Uh, and, and, and this is an area where we do partner with small businesses that are able to provide that uh, the search capacity, right? That it is much more difficult for us to maybe go out and hire, or maybe we don't want to hire, uh, and we just need that short-term help. So again, this is a great resource to help you with uh, if you work with the nature of your staff augmentation capabilities and whether that's an area that we have a search need. Thank you. Mary Ann, what role will INL play in developing H2 production? Oh, we have quite a bit of activity actually in hydrogen, uh, funded by the DOE Fuel Cell Technology Office. And we work uh, in high temperature electrolysis. We are working on taking heat from nuclear and other thermal sources and using that to produce hydrogen. We've got a couple of demos going that have both been worked with, um, uh, funded both by the Office of Fossil Energy at DOE and also the Office of Nuclear Energy at DOE. And we're also working in uh, electrochemical uh, techniques for hydrogen production and fuel cells. So we have quite a, quite a bit of activity there. And if people want to reach out or are interested, we can provide uh, contact names for the subject matter experts in hydrogen. Great, thank you. I'm scrolling through here a little bit. Um, do all or some projects require NQA quality programs? Um, the answer is some, and I can I can help you with understanding that requirement as well. Um, people are asking for my email address. It's stacy.francis at inl.gov. Stacy with a C E Y, uh, Francis with a C I S. Um, and Michelle's dropped that in the chat too, so you can you can grab that there. Um, there's some questions on specific contract types that maybe aren't that if, if you're interested in like if we use the ICPT agreements, GSA, um, some of the JIT CPA agreements, um, get a hold of me specifically, um, and I can and I can address those. There's there's just a couple questions on that. Um, John, I want to go back to a question um, based on what you mentioned earlier. Um, you spoke about the group, the growth of the lab. And so what is your data telling you in terms of the largest needs in building the talent pipeline? The, I, I sigh here because it's actually not one answer. Um, there is a, a lot of different needs. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the talent pipeline and then I might Kind of pivot a little bit and talk about other things uh in the in the kind of phd kind of talent pipeline uh or graduate kind of kind of programs uh, we've got a very strong need for for nuclear engineers of course uh, but also computational scientists mechanical engineers analytic chemists um, all sorts of data analytics types of expertise both in the cyber area and broader in terms of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning so um, quite frankly, it's, it's, it's not, you know, there's, there's no easy answer there to go, oh, we just need a bunch more nuclear engineers. Actually, we need a lot of different disciplines to execute our work. Um, you know, there was a question about hydrogen production. There's a lot of chemical engineering needed there, some electrical engineering, power engineers. By the, by the way, that is what I'm hearing a lot of in terms of needs, uh, power engineers and, uh, and cybersecurity specialists, particularly coming out of our national and homeland security. Uh, portfolio. So when I think about talent pipeline for those kinds of uh, specialties, those are the kinds of things that, that come to my mind immediately. But it is quite broad, and I'm sure I've left out some really important disciplines. Uh, but there's also the talent pipeline around uh, operators, nuclear technicians. Um, think about folks that are operating within our nuclear facilities, whether they're operating uh, in hot cells, uh, manipulators and so forth, a variety of different uh, engineering and technician types of, of jobs in those areas. Those are typically areas or, or fields, not fields, really jobs, that require quite a bit of training. Uh, so in terms, of, again, of workforce development, we're working with CEI and others to try to get folks trained up in some of those areas. But then also there's a, a fair bit of on-the-job training that we provide actually to uh, to advance the skills of, of individuals that don't, you know, there's very few people that just come into our nuclear facilities and already have 
those skills and capabilities, especially with respect to our unique facilities. So we do a lot of training. Um, and then I'll say, you know, kind of separate from workforce development, our, our biggest challenge uh, and need is really in construction right now. We've got a lot of construction projects going on currently uh, and anticipate quite a number of them uh, in the near term. Sometimes that can overshadow all these other needs, uh, but, uh, but that, that's certainly a major challenge for us going forward, especially given the growth in the area. I you, you kind of stole my next question. Um, some of the biggest challenges in the supply chain um, of, of goods and materials. And I think in the construction area, we're really seeing it in, in like for instance, concrete and finding enough of concrete to, to support not only what we're doing, but the Naval Reactors Facility and, and the big projects that they have out there. So, so the resources are getting a little tapped in, in some of those areas. Um, what kind of small businesses do you think um, this is maybe coming from a large business perspective. What kind of small businesses do you think we should be more intentionally partnering with? Any any ideas on that one? You know what I would offer because we've talked a little bit about this. I, I you know historically we end up with a lot of small businesses that are providing uh, transactional services or products. That is, uh, you know, a provider of computers or help desk technicians those kind of things in the IT world as an example uh, we're looking for more and more I think uh, uh, mission partners uh, you know where they could bring in a particular technology development capability that that fits in with our overall mission component uh, and create that kind of a strategic partnership where you are able to contribute a particular aspect of technology development that that allows you to even build your business even more outside of the INL but at the same time, it's helping INL in the development of its its, its bigger role in, in technology uh, development and demonstration. That's one area that we've talked about uh, more generically. I think uh, you know specifics. You know, it evolves depending on on uh, which aspect of our programs uh, we talk to. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so John, maybe or or. I guess maybe John, this is a good one for you. Um, how do you see small businesses helping in fostering innovation? And and Juan did just touch on that again, so I know I'm I'm kind of repeating. So I'll I'll let you maybe touch on that. Well, so, so yeah, so I'll, I'll comment based on my experience, and you know you got to be careful with making generalities, but uh, and it's also something I referred to in my remarks. From my my experience, small businesses can tend to be very focused and nimble. Um, yeah, I don't mean to insult bigger bigger companies, but sometimes it can get kind of bureaucratic and a little bit less uh, less effective at innovating. So we're, we're doing a lot of technology development where small focus companies, uh, and what I mean by focus is focus on a specific aspect of the system. So we oftentimes are doing research, but then assembling uh, and doing things at a system level, and um, and so. We're looking for those those innovations that really make a difference in system performance in a lot of different areas. You know, I always tend to think about nuclear and the small reactors that we're working on now, so-called micro reactors. But this is also true in all sorts of electronics and power engineering uh, related to uh, grid security, related to our overall cybersecurity, but also related to our clean energy mission, which again touches into grid and integration of different uh, energy technologies and different uses of energy for, for various products like hydrogen, as was mentioned. If I could weigh in for just a second, I think of one of the models that we have for DOE is the that the laboratory tries to bridge what they call the valley of death, right, between the university basic research and the industrial demonstration. And we'd like to try to be able to take a lot of things to demonstration at INL itself, but we do rely on industry to take some of our innovations and some of the technologies that we license are available to license to to application out and you know and to make some profit so this is an area we have a number of technologies that have been patented and and have copyrighted software that companies can access and this is an area where one can contact jason stolworthy our tech transfer director 
for, for lists of those types of technologies that we have that industry can take out into the marketplace. There's also, a, a they do post those as well to beta.sam.gov. So there are several of those technologies out there. Um, I saw them just the other day. So, so they do post those out to beta.sam.gov. So that's an excellent place to look for those as well. Thanks, Marianne. I, for, I forgot to mention that. Right. So it's let, me, let me, if I may, just reinforce that, because that's a great point that Marianne hit, and that is that we intentionally, as a national laboratory, do not compete with the private sector. So there is often times that we develop technology. You know, I mentioned the innovations from small businesses, but you know, we're we're doing technology development as well, and we only want to take it a certain distance because, again, we don't want to compete with the private sector. So thinking about a strategic relationship where we're developing technology in an area where a small business is is also working to develop um, their port their their business portfolio, teaming up so we can spin our technologies over uh, to the company. Is, is a really, really great opportunity, actually. And, and sometimes we get kind of stuck because we want our research to have an impact, but yet we can't you know, commercially deploy. So we need that partner um, to actually have that impact. Great point, great point. Well, we are at 10 o'clock, and so I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, again, if you um, are interested in doing business with us, please reach out to me at stacy.francis at INL. Um, what I need from you is, is like we've all mentioned here, do your research. And when you reach out to me, let me know where you think you fit within our, our um, the mission work that we do within our organization. That helps me connect you um, in a meaningful way. And send me your capability statement along with that, and then I can forward that on out to the program and hopefully get you engaged in conversation with them um, in a meaningful way. So John, Marianne, Juan, thank you for taking your time to visit with me today and to share your thoughts with our uh, supplier community. Um, from the questions we got, I think that there's a lot of great interest. There's a lot of questions. And so um, I, I think we provided some valuable information. So, so thank you again. And we will post this video for, for future reference um, out to our webpage. And as John mentioned, take a look at all the ones that we've posted out there. We've been doing this since last June. And so there's, there's 10 or 11 of them out there that you can look at um, and get a really good idea of what we're doing. I believe we're gonna go to a bi-monthly um, series now on on the supplier engagement series so so check the web page and we will be posting the next one out there for um, the May time frame as soon as we um, get a topic for it so if you have an idea for a topic again hit me up so with that thank you very much and uh, I appreciate your time thank you Stacy thank you